church looks a bit different from up here, I'm not gonna lie. Air's a bit thinner, heart races a bit quicker, <laughs> but that's all right, good to be here. Um, yeah, so like Dave said, our names are Sam, Ivy and Mitch, and we are a part of the Young Guns Preaching Initiative, which is a bit like the Avengers, but kind of worse, <laughs> but we're not too bad. Um, so we have the privilege of bringing you the word this morning and continuing the theme for the year, which is Hearts Ablaze. Um, as a church, we've been in the book of Acts and seeing how God went about establishing the early church through the finished work of Jesus on the cross and His Holy Spirit empowering ordinary people to do amazing things for Him and His kingdom. Uh, today we are in Acts 6 and 7 and looking at the story of a man named Stephen. Um, and as a team, we've been in the trenches with these chapters for about the last six weeks and it's been Amazing the depth that we found to these scriptures as God chose Stephen to draw the line in the sand between the church, the followers of Jesus and Judaism with uh, its laws and ceremonies and priesthood which through Jesus was now fulfilled. So we've called our message Spirit Empowerment uh, and I'm gonna be kicking us off this morning by talking about Stephen as the man, his role in the early church and what it means to be full of the Spirit and kind of points that stood out to me from this scripture. Uh, Then we're gonna be hearing from Ivy on how Jesus is the new temple and his Spirit transforms us and helps us to comprehend what he has done. And then finally, Mitch will bring us home um, on how each one of us is a temple of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, and we have this living hope as an anchor for our souls. So strap in, (laughs) I hope you have three brains. Um, we've got kind of, yeah, a bit to get through, but it's gonna be great. Um, So let's open up to Acts chapter six. We're gonna start from verse one. The word should be on the screen as well. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to weigh on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to the, to the prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition, however, arose from the members of the Sanhedrin Uh, sorry, the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. There we go. Uh, These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up uh, against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Yes, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that is powerful and that is active and you're gonna sink Sink it into our hearts this morning, Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Um, So I wanna raise a few points from the scripture here and really just set the scene for us. Um, So Jesus had gone into heaven. He had sent the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowered the disciples and fellow believers to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus by preaching the word, performing signs, wonders, miracles, and unifying God's people under the name of Jesus. The early church would have been filled with lots of different people groups who've come together as one church, as one body, and as and of one people. But it's not all smooth sailing, as you can probably imagine. The author, Luke, highlights one of these issues that arises in chapter six within the church itself. The Hellenistic Jews, who were the Jews that traditionally resided outside of Palestine, brought a complaint to the apostles saying that the more tradition, uh, the Hebraic, more traditional Jews were being showed favoritism with the distribution of foods and that their, that their widows were getting overlooked. 
So there was tension between these groups in the church. The apostles go, okay, you're right. This has to be done better. How about you choose seven guys who are known to be wise and full of the spirit um, and of good repute to take this responsibility for the distribution of foods that we can focus on what God's called us to do, which is the ministry of the word and prayer. So the, the, the church says, great idea, and they select seven guys for the job, one being Stephen, who we're focusing on today. So Stephen was a Hellenistic Jew. The Bible says he was a man full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, of grace, strong in faith, gifted in the workings of miracles, signs and wonders, and brilliant in debating and standing up for the truth of Jesus, which eventually led to his death and becoming the first martyr of the early church. So over these couple of chapters, it really highlights the fact that Stephen was full of the Spirit. And the question I found myself asking was, what does it actually mean to be full of the Spirit? Um, It's not like we each have, I guess, a different amount of the Holy Spirit. Um, We've each received him in his fullness. So I want to present some ideas and thoughts that the Bible tells us about the Spirit and also to confirm the kind of man that Stephen was and how he is an example for us today. Um, When we read Acts 6 and that he was full of the Spirit, I think our minds naturally go to the more like miraculous side, like great signs and wonders, and that's absolutely true. But also along with the miraculous comes the fruit of the Spirit, which would have been very evident in Stephen's life day in and day out. And why did the people choose these seven men? They didn't pick randoms. <laughs> like people in the congregation didn't go, yep, we'll, we'll do this job. But no, the apostles said, you, the congregation, you choose people who are known to be wise and full, full of the Spirit. So they would have gone home, talked about it, prayed over it and picked these guys from their congregation and Stephen being one of them. So this tells me that he was already living in this way. He was already stewarding his relationship with God and with other people. That it's not something that kind of happened when he got the position in the church, but it was something that was kind of evident and ongoing in his life. Uh Uh-oh. It says he was full of faith and did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. What they were, we don't know. We're assuming he continued Jesus' work So the healing of the sick, raising the dead, opening deaf ears. But he was also a man of great character. If we think about what his position was, it would have been highly people-focused. He was supervising the distribution of food to the widows in the church. He would have been organising, planning, communicating with all kinds of people. And he was chosen by them to fill this role. So clearly he was good at relating to people. It says in the Bible that he was full of wisdom. Um, And in James 3, 17, it tells us that the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And this would have been Stephen's character because it's God's character. And the issue with the food and the widows, that would have required great character and wisdom to actually resolve it and do it well. So let's uh, jump over to Galatians 5. Um, I want us to look at something here as Paul talks about the fruit of our flesh, our sinful nature compared to the fruits of the Spirit. I wanna highlight something in verses 19 and 21. So this is Paul listing acts of the flesh uh, and at the end of verse 20, he mentions dissensions and factions. And what was happening back in Acts 6? Why did Stephen and the seven get appointed? It was to deal with dissension and maybe some factions that were kind of happening, going on in the church, like some, still some old ways of thinking that were hanging around the church. And I found it interesting that we can be saved by grace by G- through Jesus, but there's still some old things that can hang around our lives as well that need to be dealt with. Otherwise, what happens? Division. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Oh man, I've gone off my notes, that's bad. (laughs) 
Yeah, so Paul says, uh, our sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. So it's like oil and water. <laughs> they just don't mix. But let's look at the end of chapter five where he talks about the fruit of the spirit. Paul is encouraging the Galatian Christians and how they should uh, how they should be living, which is beautifully reflected in Stephen's life also. So from verse 22, but the fruits of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Like Dave said a few weeks ago, what does it mean to be full of something? It means there isn't room for anything else, <laughs> that we're full. And the, the apostles said, choose people who are known to be full of the Spirit, along with that, full of his fruits also. And who doesn't want to be full of love, of joy, of peace? Like these are good things and they're from God. Do we want to be full of the Spirit? We can look at Stephen's story and go, well, that's for, for that time, that happened back then. That was you know, a specific scenario, whatever, you know, whatever we can say. But there's a lot happening in the church today, in our church as well. We might not be brought in front of the Sanhedrin like Stephen was. Okay, sure, but there may be a time when you're in front of a workmate, a family member, a friend, and the opportunity comes up to give an account of Jesus and his life and why we follow him. The Holy Spirit is the greatest witness of all time. <laughs> Arguably the only witness because he's the one who does the work at the end of the day. He's the one who softens hearts and convicts people of the truth and that's not us. We're about to see that no one could stand up to the wisdom of Stephen, not even the elite Jewish leaders or the best of the best. And I don't think that was because he was the smartest guy ever or anything like that. I just think he had learned to live a life that kept in step with the Spirit. And that didn't start when he got his position in the church, it was acknowledged by people. It happened from salvation all the way through to his death when instead of saying, Lord, save me, he said, Lord, forgive them. And that's, yeah, that's just amazing. So... I ask the question, what does it mean to be full of the Spirit? And in summary, to me, looking at the life of Stephen, being full of the Spirit isn't an amount of the Spirit or only performing great signs and wonders and miracles, but it's having the character of God, which is highlighted to us in Galatians 5. The men in Acts 6 were chosen because they were men of good repute. Because of their character, Stephen and the other six men were able to resolve this issue in the church. And it says in verse seven that the word of God continued to spread and the amount of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. So that's me done. <laughs> so I'm going to... Thank you. I'm gonna invite you up now, Ivy, uh, who's going to take us through the laws of Moses uh, how the laws of Moses, the gift of the temple in Jerusalem, wasn't at the end of the story, but how they preempted the coming of Jesus and how the Spirit empowered Stephen to share this reality with incredible courage. Over to you, Ivy. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Ivy. I'm normally at the PM service over in Allgate, but I'm really happy to be with you this morning. I brought my wonderful husband, Mike, who's already heard this about five times, so he's very patient with me. Um, yeah, really happy to be sharing on this passage in Acts. It's an incredible passage. It's got a lot to say to us. So Stephen's story is often used to encourage Christians to be bold, um, in the face of adversity. But I don't feel bold all the time. Even this morning, I'm standing up here. I'm a bit nervous. I'm also a bit hungry because I forgot to eat breakfast. Um, but we struggle to stand up when we need to. How can we be bold like Stephen was? Can anybody relate to really wanting to see something happen? And despite putting in all your very best effort and your hardest work, just not being able to get there. 
I'm part of a big family and I have a lot of siblings and we've always been quite competitive with each other since we were kids. Um, and I have lots of memories of going on family bike rides with dad and my two older siblings and always being at the back of the pack, always being the slowest. Um, so I would, you know, just will that I could be faster and get up the hills so that I wouldn't always be left behind. But dad just made the bike rides too hard. <laughs> but... Yeah, so it was, it was beyond my ability when I was nine. So dad would end up riding alongside me and he would encourage me and literally push me from his bike up those hills. So how was Stephen able to stand up boldly for the message of Jesus, even as it led to his death? Something that was beyond the edges of human capacity for courage and forgiveness. Did he do it in his own strength? We'll see that he didn't. We're going to look closely at Stephen and see how the Spirit empowered him to take bold action for Jesus. And firstly, we're going to see that the Sanhedrin weren't unable to comprehend this gift of Jesus, that despite having access to the same Old Testament that he did, they, they couldn't see what was going on there. So we'll consider if our response to Jesus is similar and then we'll contrast the Sanhedrin with Stephen and see how the Spirit's transformation made him different and what that might mean for us today. So we'll start by reading from Acts 6 in verse 11. So Stephen is doing miracles, he's preaching with wisdom and the Spirit, and the Sanhedrin don't like this. So they stir up opposition to Stephen's message. So verse 11, it says, They secretly instigated some men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, This man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed on to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin and he's questioned. The rest of the passage is really long, so I will paraphrase here, um, but you can go read it later. Stephen addresses the Sanhedrin by retelling the story of Abraham as it leads to the story of Moses. Stephen is guiding the Sanhedrin through the story of Moses' life in Egypt and how Moses led the Israelites out into the wilderness. Stephen finishes by reminding the Sanhedrin that the Israelites ultimately turned their back on God and were unwilling to obey him despite everything God had freed them from. So we'll pick back up in chapter 7, verse 51, where Stephen addresses the council directly. He says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your heart and your ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? Those, they killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones who receive the law as ordained by the angels, and yet you have not kept it. So that's the passage. Just a quick bit of context about what came before. In Acts 2, before Stephen is introduced to us, the Holy Spirit falls upon the apostles at Pentecost. And in Acts 4, the disciples are praying that God would see the persecution that they're facing and allow them to speak his word with boldness regardless of it. And then at the end of chapter 6, we see Stephen accused of blasphemy by a plant in the leaders, from the leaders in Jerusalem. So in verse 13, they're saying that 
you know, this man never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. We've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs of Moses that were handed to us. And they aren't incorrect here. This is Jesus's message that he taught in his life, which Stephen is echoing. But the council, they're missing the point. They can't see how this is an incredible development in the story of our salvation because they are caught up in their own ideas, their old traditions. So this is where we kind of go into our first point where it's, you know, it's really interesting actually that we are here in Acts now. Um, It works beautifully following Resurrection Sunday when Dave spoke about Jesus who became the new temple of God and the fulfillment of the law saying he would destroy the man-made temple in three days and would rebuild another one that wasn't made by man. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So what Jesus taught was that the temple and the law would not be superseded Not that they were never divine gifts, but that their God-intended fulfillment is found in the death of Jesus on the cross. So this is Jesus' true teaching that's trying to be leveraged against Stephen in front of the leaders in Jerusalem. So both Stephen and the Sanhedrin have access to this information, but their responses couldn't be more different. So in chapter 7, Stephen responds to the Sanhedrin by recalling to them the story of Moses. Stephen talks about the inception of the law of Moses, which the council accused him of wanting to destroy. He quotes Moses' prophecy about the coming of Jesus, saying, God will raise up a prophet for you from your own people as he raised me up. The one prophesied here is Jesus, who was in the congregation on Mount Sinai when Moses was given the law from God. So the Israelites were unwilling to obey Moses when he revealed the law. Instead, they pushed him aside and in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. So Stephen is challenging the Sanhedrin. He's saying, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit just as your ancestors used to do. They killed those who foretold the coming of Jesus and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones who received the law as ordained by the angels and yet they hadn't kept it. So Stephen is revealing the new temple and the fulfilled law through Jesus' life and death and he is comparing the Sanhedrin's inability to accept it to the behavior of the Israelites in the wilderness when they were presented with the law of Moses. It's a brilliant response and it's extremely cutting and we'll see how upset they get about this comparison later. So Stephen is full of the spirit and great wisdom. The council, they can't handle it. They can't accept the freedom offered through this new way of Jesus because they are dead to the spirit in the same fashion that their ancestors were. So I want to ask us the question, if I may, are we dead to the Spirit? Have we accepted what Jesus has done and called us into to bring us into new life in Him? Or are we caught up in what we want to see happen so that our hearts are closed to the Spirit? So thankfully, this passage continues and we see how God can bring us to life. Um, And we see a strange thing happening. Stephen's face is glowing at the end of chapter six. So what does this show us? It's more than just a confirmation that what Stephen is saying is true. It's a sign that God's very presence is with Stephen as he is addressing the council. So Stephen's face shines like an angel. This is incredible because it's not the first time that we've seen shining faces, actually. It happens to Moses as he encounters God's presence after receiving the law on Mount Sinai. And another place where we see people's faces shining is during the transfiguration, 
when Jesus becomes radiant in glory upon a mountain and speaks with Moses and Elijah. Referencing the transfiguration in 2 Peter 1, it reads, We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will. But men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoken from God. So Jesus' radiance is a sign that what he was doing wasn't coming from him. It was the same for Moses. It was the same for Jesus. And it's the same for Stephen. This is evidence not of information being shared, but of people who are led by the Holy Spirit. So Stephen is declaring here a message of the new temple and a fulfillment of the law. And the shining of his face shows that there's more than just Stephen at work here. It shows that God is present with him as he reveals this new way of Jesus. So the Spirit is working through him to transform this information that the Sanhedrin have missed tragically. And because of that, Stephen is able to take incredible action. So the presence of the Spirit transports the message of the law and its fulfillment to one that has transformed Stephen. He says to the Sanhedrin, you are the ones who received the law, and yet you haven't kept it. So Stephen shows here that he knows as much about Moses as they do, but the difference is they are dead to the Spirit, and he is alive in Christ. So this middle section in chapter 7 is bookended by two very different kinds of relationships to God. Stephen and the leaders in Jerusalem were presented with the same information about the gospel. The council think they know the law and their pride excludes them from enjoying this as a gift. The leaders of Jerusalem are bitter, they're liars, they're vengeful, they're murderous, they're dead to the spirit. Whereas Stephen and the early church are, they're growing, they're making disciples, they're full of the Spirit, they're courageous, they're serving the vulnerable, and they're sharing the gospel without fear for what the repercussions might be for their own safety. So Jesus came and fulfilled the law. He raised a new temple in three days, and now we can commune directly with God. And that's great. But if it just stays as information that we know, how are we any different from the council in Jerusalem? So Jesus has come so that we can be bold like Stephen was. We've been given the Spirit who transforms us to comprehend the message of Jesus. And this changed Stephen as it can change us. So Stephen, he didn't do what he did in his own strength. The Spirit transformed the gospel in Stephen so that he could take bold action for the sake of Jesus. So when information is transformed by the Spirit, we see it. The outcome of the Spirit's work in Stephen's life was that he was content to do humble tasks for the good of the marginalised. He was part of this group of early Christians who prayed that God would see the pain they were facing and would empower them to speak his word with boldness in the face of it. They're praying for the strength to lay their lives down, not have what they want to see happen come to be. And they've built their lives in response to the message of Jesus. And they live in harmony together and they show his love So when the time comes, Stephen does not back down from sharing the message, even as it placed him at risk. So the Spirit's transformation in Stephen led to a life of power and sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. And we are free because of what Jesus did. So 
Do we follow Stephen's example? Are we alive to the Spirit like he was? And do we see the fruit of the Spirit in our church and in our own lives? And I believe in many ways we do. But do our hearts continue to need the Spirit's transformation? So Stephen shined with the light of the Holy Spirit. And when his opponents took his life, he offered up his spirit to God and he prayed mercy for theirs. So may Stephen be an example for all of us of faith and a reminder of the incredible transformative power of the gospel by the Spirit, which, which changes our lives so that we can take bold action for Christ. So on that note, I will hand over to Mitch. Thanks so much, guys. Amen. Thanks for that. Ivy, how are we doing, church? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, great messages from Sam and Ivy. But yeah, I'll hopefully be able to finish this one off strong. So why don't you keep your Bibles open as we go to Acts 7, verse 54. It's, I'll go there myself as well. So don't you worry. <laughs> so here we are in Acts 7, verse 54, where it says, When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, say full, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Let's pause here for a second. Have you ever had one of those moments that has just been so simple but has shown a magnitude of meaning? Like one of those simple declarations? Yeah. One thing that won't shock uh, most of you that know me is that I love going on youth camps. Like, absolutely love them. Just came off one last week, was an absolute blast. But one thing that I normally see at these camps are these little things called care bags. What care bags are essentially is that every person on camp will have a little sandwich bag just hanging on the wall and you can just slip a word of encouragement in there. Sure, it may have been a little excuse for someone to use to slip their phone numbers into who they were interested in at the time. But when, but when written well, those letters mean the world to me. They mean so much that many of the encouragements that, I have been, that have been written to me are actually hanging up in my bedroom. Some even date back to when I was in high school as well. But we see with these care bag letters, they are a simple declaration, a simple act of boldness that reflects something way deeper. And like those letters, Stephen is easy. You see, in Stephen's life, it's easy to skim over his story but he shows the importance of being strengthened and walking in boldness through being full of the Holy Spirit. One thing that we need to remember about this passage in the persecution as well is that it's happening in the Sanhedrin. And the significance of this can be seen in Matthew 26, where Jesus is presented to the Sanhedrin. But one point that's been running through my head as I've been fascinated, that has absolutely fascinated me as we compare these two passages if we look at Jesus' only words spoken in Matthew 26, 64, like, let's just go there quickly. So the words should be on the screen. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and come on the cloud of heaven. Did you see it, church? What is the key difference between Jesus' posture when we appeared to Stephen and before he appeared to, Jesus appeared before the Sanhedrin? The question that has absolutely fascinated me as I've looked at this passage, why is Jesus standing before Stephen? Because you see, there's lots of cross-references between Jesus being sitting, seated at the right hand of God. Like for example, Hebrews 1, 2 to 3, Hebrews 12, all the gospel, what Jesus spoke at the Sanhedrin. But this is the only moment in all the scripture where Jesus is quoted as standing at the right hand of God. But that's just fascinated about the why he was standing. And from what I've learned, I believe Jesus knows the significance of what is happening. He welcomes Stephen in as he walks into the heavenly gates as the first person to be martyred by proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. And we see multiple times that in this passage that we see that Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit. And in his death, we also know that the Holy Spirit is the agent of our salvation. 
But overall, this posture by Jesus is a welcome embrace as we see Stephen complete the call of a good and faithful servant. Like if someone important walked into this room right now, like you would rise and stand for them, wouldn't you? So Jesus knows the significance of Jesus walking in before him in his death. But through this act, Jesus didn't hesitate to welcome Stephen in. But there's something more profound about what this means for the church. He welcomes Stephen in as we see the beginning of the commission to the church as Jesus ascended. That very commission, let's go to Acts 1.8, the last words that Jesus spoke before He ascended, church. Yeah, there we go, a lot of Scripture in this, but we need to unpack the importance of the life of Stephen here. So Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And this links it to my first point of having the Spirit empowering you. The importance behind it is having boldness beyond understanding. Through Stephen being empowered through the Holy Spirit, he could go to the Sanhedrin and give up his life as a living sacrifice. But through his death, the Holy Spirit wasn't done working, equipping and, and empowering the church. Quick backstory, this is happening in Jerusalem. And after Stephen's death, the church scatters. Where to? Judea and Samaria. You see that church, even though how the church spread wasn't what we expected it to be, it was the very thing that grew the church to what it is today, through Stephen being a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. And in that we see that God is the true omnipotent King of heaven on earth, reigning with authority. And we can easily see, church, the headlines opposing Christianity, which is normal now, but we need to trust in the holding firm of faith that our strength isn't based on circumstance. Our power doesn't come through letting us be the author of our own lives, but trusting Jesus with the pen of our lives so that we can glorify Him in the strengthen of the being through the Holy Spirit. As we continue on with the story, verse 57. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep and Saul approved of their killing. Benji can come up as I, came, as I share my second point. The second point about the importance of the Holy Spirit empowering us, it provides strength beyond us. But the end of this passage, the end of Stephen's life sounds incredibly similar, doesn't it? Even to the point of death, Stephen had the strength to follow through is what Jesus did through his own shed blood. And it's easy to mistake his death as a weakness, but he was able to hold firm to his call as a good and faithful servant. He created a legacy in the church. And even though we only see two chapters of his life that we have never seen before, and in his death, he was able to reflect the forgiveness of sins through his death for those who martyred him. And one thing that we need to remember about Stephen is that Stephen died for a purpose. Like another way to look about it, like I wouldn't die for nothing. Like no one in their right mind would do that. And neither did Stephen. But Stephen, through him being full of the Holy Spirit and only through that church, was he able to go out and do what he did. The Holy Spirit is the source of strength that we need. It also says in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not the church building, not the seats you're on, but us, the physical body of Christ working in unity with one another with the Holy Spirit as our source of strength. And last point, church, for your note takers. We must remember that the proper application of hope is a powerful weapon. 
Our living hope isn't something to be muted or suppressed, but to truly express joy as the Holy Spirit strengthens us. And hope may not have made sense for those who martyred Stephen, but he went through his lowest point, still seeing Jesus glorified and magnified in this life. We need to live this hope out, church. For the people around us, for the people in the church, when we live our hope, we realise how powerful it can be. And through living out hope that the Holy Spirit strengthens, that is where we see His good, perfect and pleasing will done in our lives. And notice how it doesn't say His safe will, but the boldness that we can have in faith will grow as our hearts are on fire for Christ. Why don't you stand to your feet, church? Hills, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that lived in Stephen and raised Jesus from the grave lives in us today. So with this Spirit, let it transform us to speak the truth of the Gospel in the boldness of faith. And sometimes in that boldness, you need to be strengthened by vulnerability. It is in our weakness that we find that we find strength in faith through Christ. So I'd love right now for like prayer team and elders, if you wanna come up for prayer as I pray, that'll be great. And as I've been writing this, as I've been praying for you guys, as I've been preparing, like I would love to pray for those who would want to live in the boldness, hope and strength that the Holy Spirit empowers so that we may live out the kingdom assessment that He has pointed us to do. So church, let's be a people who through the Holy Spirit empowering us, live out in the boldness, strength and hope through faith that goes beyond the world's understanding. Dear God, just thank You for able, thank You for how Your Spirit moves and how You want to dwell with us, Lord. Thank You that You are our source of strength, that You are our source of peace, Lord. And we just pray that You charge us on to fight the good fight of faith as we go out of this place, Lord, as we live as a living sacrifice, Lord. Yes, Lord, let You just continue to flow out in boldness of faith as our hearts are ablaze for You, as our hearts are on fire for You, Lord. And let that be the very thing that sees Your Kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And let us be, through our boldness, strength and hope, let that be the thing that equips the priesthood of all believers, Lord. Let us be ready to equip one another, to champion one another on, Lord, in faith, so that we can live the good fight of faith that has been appointed to us, Lord. Yes, Lord, we honour You, we praise You, we give You all the glory. And all God's sons and daughters said, Amen. Amen.